as I mentioned, uh, this month, as we get to move towards Thanksgiving, I want to spend some time talking about what it means to live a generous life. Because gratitude and generosity are closely connected and tied. And I would dare say that you really can't live a generous life if you haven't cultivated a spirit of gratitude. But it's also hard to be grateful unless you have a spirit of generosity. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that as we dive in. And so the text that will be guiding us, at least our principal text, that will be guiding us this month is coming from 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I'm going to pick up at verse 6 and go all the way down to verse 15. Reading from the NIV, this is what it says in 2 Corinthians 9, 6. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Verse 10 says, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Amen. A generous life. Let the words of my mouth, God, and the meditation of our collective hearts be acceptable in thy sight, for you alone are our strength and redeemer. A generous life. I know people don't um, really welcome and relish hearing sermons about giving because we automatically think, well, they're trying to get us to give more money down to church. <laughs> and that's okay. I've been around church long enough to know. But even as I said last week, there are things that we think sometimes that just aren't right. And we have to make sure that we don't lean to the thinking of the world and the wisdom of the world, but that we really listen to God. Amen. And so as we start with this series, uh, can we get the, uh, oh. and as we start with this series, I really want to make sure that you lean in to what God is saying, so that you can hear God's voice and understand how God might be teaching us and looking for us to simply be generous. I found this image and I liked it because it had this definition. It says that generous is an adjective that means free in giving or sharing, noble, open-handed. And that open-handed part was the part I really liked enough. Because what God seeks for us to be as the church is to be ones who go through life with hands and with hearts and with mouths, and with ears, and with spirits that are open. Open not to any old thing, but open first and foremost to God's voice, to God's spirit, to God's desire for us, and that we would run after those things. Not with clenched fists, but that we would come before God, even with hands open and lifted, saying, God, as you give to me, I will then be able to give to others. 
And so even in the text I just read, and as I said this morning, the idea of living a generous life is tied to cultivating a spirit of gratitude. And that's why it pairs so greatly with us moving towards Thanksgiving when everybody is thinking about what they're thankful for, which of course we should be doing all the time, not just in November, but it's important and it's good that we have a time where as a country, we pause and say we are grateful. But this idea of having gratitude is so important because even as I'm trying to say through this image, gratitude leads to generosity and generosity leads to gratitude and this kind of goes around and around. And so what does that mean? If perhaps you're somebody who struggles to find ways to be grateful, you struggle to see what you are and can be grateful for because maybe you have a lot of challenges and situations that seem to be so heavy, then I would say try to be generous because when you're generous, that will cause you to see how blessed you are. And perhaps the other way around. If you're someone who struggles with generosity because you just feel like you don't have enough to give, you feel like, no, I got to keep what I have, I work real hard for this, uh-uh, nah, you're not getting it. So that's okay, but then I say to you, why don't you focus on being grateful? Because if you focus on gratitude, then you will understand that generosity will flow from that. And so the two are in tandem, and that's simply what our text said this morning in 2 Corinthians, really 9, 11 through 12. This is what the writer says, that you will be enriched in every way for all generosity, which produces thanksgiving to God. And so it's right there, that generosity produces thanksgiving. Now what the writer is saying here is that when we give, the persons who receive will be grateful to God and grateful to us. And here's the blessing. If all of us are giving, yes. then all of us will be receiving. Amen. Amen. If everybody is giving, then everybody will receive, and there will be enough, and there will be gratitude that flows through. But don't miss this. For the ministry of this service, this giving that he's talking about in this text, is not only supplying the literal need to the saints, but it also overflowing in many acts of thanksgiving to God. And so the text is letting us know that thanksgiving is not just something that we say or do with our lips. But when we're generous, there are acts of thanksgiving that come along with and flow from generosity. And so what I'm trying to get us to do in this series is to look at ways that we can simply be more available to God to express gratitude and generosity. Make sense? Yes. And it's even what I've said today in my thought for the week, that generosity is all about making the most of the opportunities we receive to give. Important. It's important. 
But it's also important that you understand that generosity is a byproduct of being connected to Christ. Because I make a distinction between simply giving and being generous because generosity is a spiritual principle that comes with a grace that God gives to Christians to be able to do it. And so here's the end of the story. No, you and I can't live a generous lifestyle simply in our own strength, simply because we have a lot and we want to give a lot. That's not going to happen. And the, the, the science of it, the studies of it shows that unless you cultivate certain principles, it really doesn't matter how much you have. If you don't know how to use it, then it's still going to be wasted and going to be used improperly. You have heard about people who win the lottery, and people win the lottery, and they say, yo, I win the lottery, I'm going to go and give money to the church, and I'm going to go and do all these things. And what happens is, if you don't have principles of saving and know how to be fiscally responsible, just because you get like a downpour of thousands of dollars in a little bit, you're just going to be broke again because right. you've got to learn to cultivate. you got to cultivate the principles. Amen. And so God helps us when we're connected to Christ, to cultivate the right principles in our lives. And the last kind of general thing I want to say is that generosity is about giving in a way that points others to God. And that's really what we're all talking about, what we've been talking about since Resurrection Sunday, about being the church, about living in a way that God gets the glory, is that whatever I do, however I live, I want it to raise to the quality and the standard that someone can see God in and through whatever it is I'm doing. It's simply not enough for me just to feel good because I did some great thing. It's really more important that I point others to God. Amen. That I let someone else know that they can have hope in Christ. That I let someone else see that God will provide for them. That God is still able to be, to be connected to and that they can still reach God through how I live my life. And so a generous life is something that we should all be striving towards. And so in this sermon, this is a foundational sermon, I really want to help us to kind of get the framework for what we're going to need for the rest of the month. Because we're going to kind of take some principles and some specific places about where I want us to live generous lives. But this is just a general kind of sermon to lay the foundation. And so we'll come back to these principles. And so let me share with you here three areas of consideration that we need to focus on when it comes to generosity. These are three areas that we have to be, be focused upon if we're going to be able to cultivate the spirit of generosity in our lives and thereby live a generous lifestyle. Uh, and, and here it is, the three speak threes. Amount, attitude, and affection. These are three considerations that you have to keep in mind that go along with what it means to be generous. The first thing is the amount. I'm writing the text because I don't want you guys to think I'm making this up, so I'm in the Bible. Hallelujah. 2 yeah. Corinthians 9 and 6, the first thing the writer says is, remember this. Yeah. Meaning, I told you this before, but I'm highlighting it here because it's so important. Here's what I want you to remember. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. That right there is talking about the amount that you give. Amen. So while some people might say, oh, it doesn't matter what you give, just give anything, no, that's not biblical. The amount is important. How much time you give to your relationships makes a difference. Amen. You sow sparingly into cultivating a good relationship with your children, with your spouse, with your co-workers, and guess what? You're going to reap sparingly. You find yourself consistently absent, can't never show up for the birthday parties, for the anniversaries, for the graduations, and doing those good things. You do go find yourself people saying, no, nah, I can't come, no, nah, I'm not going to be able to do it, I'm not going to make it. Because you're not going to have invested and sown anything that you'll be able to reap back. Come on now. So the amount that we give is important, and he's saying, look, if you give a little, you're going to get a little, and that is not generosity. And so it's not just about giving any old thing, however I feel, just whatever is in my pocket, I'll give that. It's about giving in a way that understands that the amount that I give is important and I should be looking and seeking to give in an extravagant and lavish way. And I want to be careful though, because the amount is not about comparing how much you give compared to your brother or sister. That's not what it's about. 
It's not about comparing between each other. It's about knowing what you are able to give based upon what you have received and making sure that when you look at that equation, you don't end up just always giving the least amount. Because if you always give the look, I mean, it's like this. Some people, you know, the offer play go by. Some people like, I'm not giving anything. So they already decide. And then some people, they might pull out their money and they might have like a one, a five, a 20, a 50. And they look at it and they'd be like, okay, I'm just giving one of me. I gave, so hey. And then somebody else might say, oh, well, I had a really good week. I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give five. And, and, and that's, that's okay, but if you always go to the end, to the smallest amount, just doing the least you can do, I'm just trying to let you know that that's not the cultivation of a generous life and a spirit of generosity. Because if you sow sparingly, the biblical principle is you're going to reap sparingly. Amen. Not only is amount important, but the Bible also tells us that attitude is important. Look at 2 Corinthians 9, 7, the A portion. Uh, the writer says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. Yes. That, that, that you should give um, in a way that's intentional and deliberate. So that means that I, I, I don't give simply, um, you know, whatever comes to mind. Like, you know, some of y'all are already thinking about the Christmas gifts. Some of y'all been thinking about Christmas gifts for two months. Man, y'all got, some of y'all parents got Christmas gifts in the closet at home, don't y'all? They're already been storing that stuff. But, but you're being very intentional, and, and you're being very deliberate about what you're going to give because generosity comes from a heart that's willing and eager to share, and we should be thinking about that. It shouldn't just be on a whim. It's okay if you give on a whim, but most of the time, and this is what happens to me when people call you up and they stop me, you know, they want to say, especially, oh my goodness, whenever I'm trying to go to the post office or Trader Joe's, those people be in front of the uh, metro, they be driving <laughs> crazy. Do you have a moment? No, I don't. I'm not generous then. I'm like, no, I got to go to the post office. Because they want me to, it's got something to do with environmental awareness and some children or something. And I'm not saying it's a good, it's not a good thing. What I'm saying is, I decide and I'm very deliberate about how I do my charitable giving. I don't kind of make it up on the whim. I already know certain things I give to every year, and then I always say to them, can you give me something to read? Can I come and look at it? Because I want to be very intentional and purpose in my heart for what to give. Because I think that helps me to be a better steward of handling what God has given to me. Because generosity doesn't just mean you just give any old way, any old time, every time. But there is a sense of knowing that you decide in your heart, but you don't do it reluctantly, and you don't do it out of compulsion. And in some verses it says you don't do it even as a duty. You don't say, well, I gotta give a tithe because the Bible says. I mean, think about you. Think about when people give you things with that kind of attitude. Can I have some? And you're saying, all right. And you're, and you're like, forget it then, keep it. <laughs> I don't want none. This is why I tell people, I don't, I don't usually volunteer my candy. I'm sorry, I just know. I already know. <laughs> if I have sour punch straws and you want one, you better ask. Because I'm not going to be volunteering because I don't know. Just pray for the pastor. I tell y'all that every week. Because I already decided in my heart, I want this whole package. I can't give that up. But what you got to think about it. But do it in a way that's not compulsive and not like, oh, this is my duty. This is so hard to give. Because everything that you own first belongs to God. Come on, man. Say it. Say it now. There's nothing. Air. <laughs> Heartbeat. Working limbs to go do your job. Yes. A mind that thinks. Yes. A All of that stuff belonged to someone else before it came to you. And so generosity is not like, oh, this is mine. I don't want to get it. Generosity is like understanding. I realize that I'm just stewarding this and watching it for someone else. That's God. And God's going to come back one day and say, what would you do with those talents and gifts I gave you? Well, I went to church every Sunday, Pastor. I understand. I understand you went to church every Sunday. But the question is, what did you do with the talents and the gifts I gave you? Did you use those things? 
Or did you just show up in the building? See, y'all don't want to hear this. Generosity has to be intentional and deliberate. It comes from a willingness and an eagerness to share. But not only amount, not only attitude, but last, affection. And this is good because generosity comes from a desire to please God. Look at the text. I'm still in the text. I'm right here in verse 7b. It says, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So, you know, here's the deal. Whereas the, the, the amount has to do with me saying, I'm going to do it extravagantly. I'm going to do the best I can every time. And attitude says, I'm going to do it with the right heart and the right motivation. Affection is pretty much saying, I'm going to do what I know God loves. Hallelujah. What if that was your motivation for whether or not you were generous? Not how much you had, not whether it was convenient, but what if every time you considered whether you were going to be generous, you decided to do it because I want to do what God loves. I want to do what's going to bring a smile to God's heart. I want to be pleasing to my creator and Lord. Hallelujah. Well, that's what affection's about. Because you should give and develop a cultivation of a generous life because your motivation is understanding that God loves a cheerful giver. And if that's what God loves me, some of y'all know, y'all have a relationship, y'all be trying to be what they want to be. Oh, you know, I like to cook. No, I'm not. Yeah, yeah, I, know, I love sports. Yeah, yeah, I, I like to do that. No, you lying, but you just trying to be what you think. They, or y'all don't tell the truth. Amen. <laughs> and then y'all get to the relationship. I thought you said you like sports. I just said that because I wanted you to like me. But when we're in a relationship with God, we should be doing the things that's gonna, that God's going to love. Yeah, yeah. And here's the other trick. Even if it's something I don't like to do, when I get close to God, God can teach me how to love what God loves. Amen. Amen. And God will teach me how to hate what God does. Because some of us know we used to be in love with some things and some situations and some places that weren't pleasing to God at all. But now, because we have cultivated a relationship with God, those things don't even give us any pleasure because I'm more concerned about God being pleased than I am about pleasing myself. Because I'm cultivating generosity. And so, as we go through this series, think about the amount. Think about your attitude. And think about the affection. Why you're doing it. Here's the other thing I want to show you. Because with anything in life that we're supposed to do, there are always things that will block and interrupt yes. and deter us from being able to do what's pleasing to God. And so I was important at the beginning of this series that we put, I put in your mind some things for you to look out for that I'm going to call things that block a generous spirit. Amen. This is just to kind of help you be aware that these are things that if they're present in your life, they're going to keep you from being able to cultivate a generous spirit. You might have the right amount. You might have the right attitude. You might be focused on affection from God. But if these things are present, then you are going to have a hard time cultivating a generous spirit in your life. Is this ignorance, idolatry, individualism? Did I spell that right? That's a lot of words in that word. A lot of letters. And inconsistency. Real quick. Ignorance. Ignorance will keep you and I from being able to cultivate a generous spirit. If we don't know what God wants, it's going to be hard for us to do and to live in ways that will please God. Amen. So James 1, 5, and 6 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives sparingly, no, who gives generously, to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. For the one who doubts is like a wave in the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. So what I'm letting you know is that we need God's wisdom to develop the proper understanding about generosity. It's not going to become innate to us. It's not going to always make sense. God wants us to have wisdom on this area. That's the reason why I'm teaching on it. But you have to lean in and receive it. And James tells us, if you lack wisdom in any area, ask God. Yes, yes. God doesn't come and say, what? You don't know that by now? Because it says there's no judgment. God isn't going to find fault with you asking the question. God's going to say, you need wisdom? Come on, I got a bunch for you. Let me give you what you need. So don't be ignorant about how God would have you live your life. Because wisdom is available. But not only do we have to watch out for ignorance, but we 
you gotta watch out for idolatry. And I know idolatry is a hard word in 2019. Because again, we think about like last week, that big 20 or 90 foot statue that Nebuchadnezzar put out, and we think that that's an idol. But idols are simply anything that distracts you from doing your best and living your life to glorify God. And, and so idolatry will be a block from you being able to live a generous spirit because idolatry switches the priority in your life from what God wants to what you want. And so we must be on guard so that we don't make money our possessions, even our preferences, and I am. God must be our priority and our first aim. So look, in Exodus 20, verses 3 through 6, it, it, this, is, this is God speaking at the time when the Ten Commandments were being given, and he says, you shall not have any other gods, little g, before me. Yes. Yes. You shall not make any for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven, above, or on the earth, beneath, or in the waters. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Yes. So you have to understand that these things can become idols. How much money you have. And you can say, well, I'm not going to give that much. Or how much time you have. Or what your possessions are. Or how you are allowing God to use your body. You can say, no, I'm not going to sing over there. I'm not going to go and do that. Because you are more concerned about what you want. Yes, yes. This happens in marriage a lot. I, I hear. <laughs> <laughs> that you don't want to do what your spouse wants. You want to do what you want. So you want to live like you're single, but you're married. Because you never consider that your body doesn't belong to you. Okay. Hallelujah. So you can make yourself an idol. Mm -hmm. You can make your money an idol. You can make your possessions. You can make your preferences an idol. And instead of saying, what does God want? I say, well, what feels good? What's convenient? What will make me happy? Hallelujah. And that's when you're falling into idolatry. And that can block generosity. But not only that, individualism. And this is an important one, especially for us living in the United States at this time, living in Northern Virginia. We don't even want nobody to be in our same lane with us, man, on 495. We want our own space. Yes. But individualism is something that blocks our ability to be generous. This is what it says in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. I didn't think I was going to get any amens right there. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And nothing here, I looked it up in the Greek, nothing means nothing. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. Yes, yes, yes. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as so we aren't in, it's not rugged individualism that's going to allow us to please God. It's knowing that we become better together. Yes. So we have to shed off our individualism and not yield to that. It doesn't mean we can't be individuals. It doesn't mean we can't like the things we like. But it simply understands that we have to make sure that whatever we like, we bring into the community. So it's kind of like an orchestra. I need to know how to play my instrument very well. I need to perfect being me. But I also have to perfect me in such a way that I can play well with others. Hallelujah. And so my, 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 my ability to be individual means that I'm concerned about others. And I'm looking towards the community. Amen. But last one, I think this might be the biggest one. That's why I saved it for last. One of the biggest things that blocks us from being able to be generous and live a generous life is simply that we are inconsistent. We're inconsistent. And we just don't do it enough to see the benefits and the results of doing it. If you only cook one dish on Thanksgiving, you are not going to perfect cooking that dish. And that's the reason why your family don't want you to drink. Amen. <laughs> You gotta cook this morning on Thanksgiving, man. Preach. I don't just cook my chili once or twice. See, I cook chili all the time. I know what the recipe is. I tweak it. I work with it. And we are not gonna be generous by doing it offhandedly, once in a while, every now and then, whenever the Spirit moves us. No. You're gonna be generous when you have consistently developed the habit 
habit of generosity over every area of your life. Not just with your money, but with yourself, with your time, with your talent, with your treasure, with your thoughts. Sometimes generosity looks like getting up to go watch your friend's children when they have something in their baby should have fell through. That inconvenience you, but you got to do it. But when you are generous throughout your life, even if you don't have to do that one thing, whatever you're called upon to do in that instance will come more freely because you have developed the habit of it. Here's what Acts 20, 33 says. This is Paul right before he was leaving to go on a trip. And he was saying to those that he was leaving, I have not coveted anyone's silver, gold, or clothing. You yourselves know that with these hands of mine, I supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, you must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And quite honestly, many of us are so consumed with how and when and what we're going to receive that we can't cultivate consistent giving to become generous. Amen. You're not going to get it sporadically doing it. If you want to live a generous life, you have to learn to cultivate generosity everywhere you go, all the time. And so that's what we're going to talk about this morning. This ability to be generous. Amen. Let me leave this one scripture with you out of 1 Timothy 6. Timothy is a pastor. He's getting pastoral guidance from Paul. And this is the word. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor put their hope in wealth. And I want to let you know, again, this richness is not limited to monetary richness. It is talking about that. But any area where you are rich, you have to be careful that you don't put your hope in the fact that you have a lot. Because at any moment, life could shift. So where should our hope be? But put their hope in God, who richly provides for us some things, a few things, many things, no. Everything for our enjoyment. Command them, do good. To be rich in good deeds. And to be generous and willing to share. Whatever you have. Even your candy pastel, yes, yeah, my friend. In this way, you lay up treasure for yourselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. And the last thing he says here is, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to your care. Yes. Because that's what generosity comes down to. The fact that I am simply a steward, and God has entrusted things into my care. And I want to use these things in a way that when Jesus comes back and starts to pull out and get a reckoning, Jesus says, you've been faithful over a few things. I'm going to make you rule over me. And so if we're going to develop a generous life, we have to be connected to God. We have to know Jesus because Jesus is our example. And then Jesus will help us to have the right attitude, to give the right amount, and to have the right motivation, which is affection for God. And to look out for all of those things that can block us. So I won't have to be walking in idolatry. I won't be so individualistic. I won't be inconsistent. And I won't be ignorant because I seek the knowledge of God. Amen? Amen. 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 Amen.